This is the Pick 6 Podcast, mid-August, early August edition. Uh, I'm Sam McEwen, along with Dirk Chatlin, who is in his vehicle. Evan Bland, who does not have a background behind him, so he must not be at the stadium. And our newest, uh, our newest guest, who is going to be a, a permanent guest, in Jimmy Watkins. Uh, he is our new uh, Nebraska basketball writer. And, of course, like everyone who covers Nebraska athletics, he'll be doing some football. Uh, so, Jimmy, how you doing? Feeling good, Sam. Excited to be here. Good, good. Uh, it uh, he he started. He has first day yesterday, uh, or yeah, yesterday, and so today, August fifth, uh, he's he's with us, and so he'll be with us for the duration of many seasons to come. And we're going to talk some Nebraska basketball about midway through this podcast. Uh, we're going to start with obviously Nebraska football, which has begun camp. We'll talk a little bit about. Um, I have, I have the, uh, the annual associated press ballot for the state of Nebraska. I have to put that in next Tuesday. And so we'll talk a little bit about, um, kind of what I'm thinking through and the sheer difficulty of Nebraska's schedule, because it's possible I'm still mulling it over, but I may be putting six of Nebraska's opponents in the top 25, which would be a lot. Um, most people will not have that many, but I may, um, because I think I feel a little bit better about Minnesota than some other folks, but we'll, we'll discuss a little bit of Nebraska's schedule because that informs, their success or lack thereof, then we'll get over to hoops. We'll talk to Jimmy a little bit about what it's like to come into this and what he thought of Nebraska athletics as an outsider, because Jimmy is not from around here. He's not from the Husker bubble. Um, he is uh, coming in with a, with a jeweler's eye uh, from the outside. So he's going to come in and, and maybe, you know, give us a perspective that we don't often get uh, on these podcasts because so often we're, you know, from the outside looking in um, and, and kind of thinking about that. So we will, uh, We'll, we'll go there. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little realignment. It seems like a quiet week. Maybe news will break while we're sitting here talking, but it feels like the Big Ten is in a little bit of a holding pattern, uh, and they will be um, moving on from there. Um, all right, we'll start with this. Football camp, uh, we're a week in. Evan, I'll start with you. Um, you've been at all the availabilities. You went to practice yesterday and watched them run around in compression shorts from a distance because we couldn't get too close to them. Couldn't get too close right. to Husker players. Um, any impressions that you've had so far? Any thought processes that jump out at you uh, based on the people that we've talked to and the things that you've seen? I mean, for me, the fascination comes on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, there's so many knowns defensively. Uh, you know, what's what's left to necessarily learn about some of the black shirts that are back this year? So I've been fascinated with what's going on on the offensive side. I mean, we saw Marquis step in action on Wednesday at the, the little early part of practice that we got to see. And that was notable. I thought to see that and then to hear Matt Lubick, the offensive coordinator say afterwards that uh, they might not put him on a, a so-called pitch count after all, they might, you know, if they had a scrimmage or if they had a game at that moment, they let him roll, let him go. So I thought that was notable at a position that remains really unsettled with him and Gabe Irvin and Sevian Morrison and Marvin Scott and Jacquez Yant and Ramir Johnson. I mean, the list goes on and on, but having step as part of that conversation, I think is important as Nebraska is looking to uh, determine a, a feature guy and, and, and determine one sooner than later. Um, you know, the other thing that's been interesting to me, I think has been uh, kind of getting to know a, a little bit more about the offensive line this year. I mean, Scott Frost at big 10 media days had said, had identified that position as one that he said uh, he was most excited to see out there. And I felt like, especially in some of the availability this week, talking to guys who've been in the program a long time, um, there was just more continuity there. And it's in such stark contrast to a lot of the offense where they're essentially starting over at running back. They're starting over at receiver in a lot of ways. Um, it, but you have this position in the offensive line where you have a number of fifth year guys uh, that are contributing. You have a couple tackles and Bryce Benhart and Turner Corcoran that are, uh, looks like just getting started on what could be multi-year, uh, you know, sessions as, as, as some key players for Nebraska. And then just hearing about some of the guys uh, that live together. I mean, you're talking about a, a lot of older guys rooming with Teddy Prohaska and Henry Latusky, who are still teenagers. And um, just the, the, the continuity that seems to be building at that position is really interesting. So I think as we start to form an opinion about what Nebraska's offense could be. Uh, it's a lot, I, I guess, a lot more um, popular to talk about the skill position guys, but it feels like the guys in the trenches really 
are establishing some continuity that we haven't seen in Nebraska in a while. So those are a few things that stood out to me. Yeah, Nebraska remains undefeated in being closer than ever, tighter than ever, loving each other more than they ever have. Um, this is the best it's ever been in terms of chemistry. That, that seems to be a message that um, is just remarkable. I mean, one year it's barbecues, it's bass fishing, it's now it's golf. Uh, it, it, you know, it just keeps going on and on. I will say this, that, and, and, and that's my, that's the cynical side of me saying that, but, but let, let me add this, that I think when you're in, when you're in a, a year four of an operation, I do feel like there is a shift in um, all of the leaders on this team are probably all pretty much Frost guys. Matt Sickerman obviously was was signed in 2017, and so I guess he's you know a little bit older. But but Matt Farniak and Brendan Hymas in, in many ways were Mike Cavanaugh's recruits, and you'll notice that they they were very appreciative of Cavanaugh on the way out. Um, and I felt like to some degree, even though I think both those guys are going to be really good in the NFL. Um, once COVID hit and they knew that their senior season was going to be messy and kind of screwed up and all kinds of things, I think there was probably an understanding on some level. Well, might as well get this through this year. <laughs> and so um, both of them got drafted. Uh, both of them, I think, are in the two deep. Both of them have a great chance to have nice careers in the NFL. I think both of them are talented players. Um, but the leader of this particular offensive line is Cam Jurgens. Mm -hmm. The leader of the wide receiver room are all guys that, quite frankly, joined the program in the last two years. I mean, Levi Falk is a leader in that room. Uh, Samari Ture is a leader in that room. None, none of these guys have any sort of um, tethered experience to the, private, the previous coaching staff. At running back, it's literally all Ryan Held's guys. And, of course, Adrian Martinez has never known uh, a different head coach. Um, Austin Allen kind of did, but I think Austin Allen, you know, belongs now to this coaching staff. Travis Vokalek didn't know anybody else. And so what part of what happens is if you're if you're in a place long enough, you begin to you begin to, uh, you know, um, embody the values, whether you like those values or not, of the leadership structure. And I think as a result, it feels a little bit more cohesive. And so when I think about the things that I've appreciated, at least over the first week, I think the coaches when we went to practice yesterday, they were coaching the kids a little harder. It wasn't, you know, look at how nice we are to the players. And they've been more honest about the um, about players' flaws, which I appreciate. Now, Greg Austin's always been honest about that. But I think there's a greater honesty there with some of the coaches because I think they know these are all my guys. Um, I don't have to win anybody's trust. They came and committed to us, and so they're either going to trust us or they're going to bounce. And so I do feel like there's a greater sense of comfort with one another about what they can or can't say to each other about their weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. And, you know, there's, there's just more depth there on, on the O-line too. Like as you kind of go through it, like, uh, you know, well, should be. Be. I mean, but like, they've, they've I, only I, recruited 31 of them. I mean, but like, I get what you're saying about every year, everyone's faster and stronger and, and more cohesive, yeah. but like, you know, Nebraska's got a guy in Trent Nixon who started, 12 games. Yeah. Um, you know, it's got Nuri, uh, you know, Noelle from, uh, who transferred from Colorado state was a seven game starter over there. So like, right. it, it's, it's, and neither one of them are going to start for Nebraska. No, they're not. And, and they love right away. They love Brant Banks. Who's been in the program three years and could start at a lot of places, I think. And, and so it's, it's some of it's quantifiable. Like it is deeper, at least in terms of experience than it has right. been. Um, so, guys, yeah. guys, in addition to that, I think just the sort of the psychological scar tissue of playing through a pandemic season, uh, you know, some of that, I think it's got to be just a, a relief. And I know we're still in the midst of this thing for a lot of people and, and you know, hospitalizations are, are skyrocketing and all that. But but I think it's got to be a little bit of an energy jolt just to put last season behind you and to feel like you're entering what you know should be a much more normal season uh I, I think I I sense that just in the in the mood around the team too that it's like man it's it's good to be back and just playing what what could be a normal football season again yeah you know, I think Nebraska the way in which it fought to play football last year and all the buttons it attempted to push and desiring to do that I think um, can create a I don't know. I, I just think by the end of that season, everybody was completely exhausted. 
mentally too, emotionally, mentally, physically, you know, they came back in April. They had to wait, gosh, five months to play a football game from the time they came back to the time they started the season. Um, I think they probably all got real tired of sitting around, um, you know, so there was just, I think there was a level of exhaustion within that program uh, that, that probably doesn't exist. I, you know, it probably doesn't exist at this moment. Um, I'll be curious to see, for example, if, if volleyball teams, particularly Nebraska volleyball, whether they feel exhausted because they haven't had a break really. I mean, they, they just finished their 2020 season in April of 2021. I don't think they probably did a lot of off time, whereas you would normally have off time, you know, uh, in winter and spring, didn't really have much of that. Um, so I think I'll be curious to see if they can sustain, you know, the 30 game schedule or whatever, if there's lulls in the middle of the season or just like we didn't have our A game because we've been at this for a year. Uh, football doesn't have to deal with that. Men's basketball doesn't have to deal with it. They, they base those two sports, the, the big ticket sports basically stayed um, on schedule. Um, hey, Sam, just one more thing. When you, when you go, when you go through an experience that bad, I also think there's sort of a moment when you get to the end of it, it's sort of like, you know, are you in or are you out? And if you're, if you're in, I think, I think you just naturally kind of commit, you know, to it. Um, it's, that was, you know, a really bad experience for, for basically everybody involved. And you saw, you know, some attrition at the end of it. I think if you stick around, you just sort of, you just naturally are, are more all in than you ordinarily would be. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's, I think that's very fair. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded by, we had, we don't, you know, usually each summer college football reporters talk a lot about Phil Steele, but his magazines haven't necessarily been in all the places they normally are. And so I bought mine for, via download or whatever. And it's worth noting that again, and, and I'll bring this to Jimmy here in a second, within the Nebraska bubble, we know a lot, we have a lot of local knowledge within, you know, about Nebraska football. I think we would all say that the offensive and defensive lines are about as good as they've been in a while. Well, Phil Steele doesn't rank either of Nebraska's offensive and defensive lines inside the top 50 of his position groups. You know who's in there? Liberty. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's to me, it's notable that when you get out, when you kind of go outside the, the bubble, the Xavier Betts opinion of we're going to shock everybody, um, it, you know, dissipates right about the time you go, you go across the bridge to Iowa. But people just don't people don't see that they don't feel it um and so it's and and we as reporters and 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 also nebraska fans have learned to distrust this feeling that like um i'll i'll write something and i'll post it on social media and i'm getting a lot more yeah 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 i heard this before let me let me see what it actually happens and one of the reasons i appreciate jimmy's perspective is he had asked a question when we were at lunch, not long after he had joined us, you know, that I thought was notable about, you know, well, Scott Frost is, you know, what, what's his status with the program? And I think that's a legitimate question that exists pretty much everywhere outside of, you know, the borders of Nebraska. And so, Jimmy, I wanted to bring you in here. I um, mean, we'll talk about basketball in a minute. Um, but, you know, you have an outsider perspective. I mean, you've you've lived in a lot of different places. Um I don't know that you would say college football is your number one sport. And so you come at this from a little bit more of an analytical outside view. And I'm curious um, when I say Nebraska football, what it, what was your perception over the years of uh, over the last oh, four or five years of what that is? And did it even hit your radar much at all? Well, what Nebraska football has been since Scott Frost has been here has been losing program. They haven't put a winning season together yet which is why I asked the question I did at lunch, which, I, which is a heck of a way to introduce me to people. Yeah, which is, should, the, should the prodigal son be on the hot seat is a great way for me to make friends around here, I'm sure. That's but, okay. um, I think a lot of people yeah. have the same question, to be honest with you. No, yeah, I mean, even the, the better, quote-unquote, version that I, of Nebraska that I grew up with, the ceiling seemed around 9, 10 wins. And another discussion we had at, at that same lunch was, is that the, the permanent cap? on the program right now the the i'm sure that the people there's a lot of people around lincoln and in that program who still believe that they can get back to the glory days and maybe that's uh in part because they're constantly reminded of them by every face that has 
uh, significant power in the program, not every, but the two biggest faces in the program right now are both stark reminders of those days. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the outside opinion of Nebraska has a shorter memory, I would say than, than probably the people around here do. Yeah. You know, I think it's hard for, you know, for people who, and Dirk went through the nineties as did I, and I think we went through it on the younger end of it, you know, I was, uh, oh gosh, uh, I was 17, 18 years old. I was a senior in high school in 95. Dirk, I think was a uh, freshman or sophomore. And that was probably a good way to do it because when I went off to college, they still want a natty in 97, but you know, we also saw the shift to Solich and the, you know, the gentle decline into the good night. Um, and I would say this, there is a religious quality about the nineties, specifically 93 through 97, that almost has a, um, you know, sort of a mystical power over the whole program. Like it, 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 it hasn't really ever worn off. Um, people look back at that time and they have, they, you know, imbue themselves with a faith and hope that that could happen again. Um, there were probably very specific reasons why Nebraska was able to have those, that success at that particular moment. Um, it isn't necessarily related to, um, the decency of them as human beings. Like I, and some of that often comes up of like, well, the real way Nebraska is going to get back to where it used to be is they just have to be the best human beings again. And I'm not suggesting that there weren't great people back then. There were um, that, that held values that I ha I happen to agree with in many cases, but I, I think Nebraska was really good in football for reasons that were above and beyond the quality of their character. And character alone uh isn't might might not get you beat against far less talented teams like northwestern and northwestern is far less talented than nebraska almost every year but it's not gonna it's not gonna get you a win over ohio state or wisconsin on that topic alone and so i think nebraska fans still struggle to maybe appreciate how good nebraska was then and contextually how much better they were than their competition everybody's gotten better. That's the other thing. Nebraska's gotten a little worse, maybe a lot worse since, since the late nineties, but everybody else has gotten better. And with the maybe exception of Kansas, like teams care now about college football. And they didn't, a lot of teams didn't care in the nineties. Now they do. And it's, it's much harder to just win games by rolling the ball out on the field because you care more than the other team. The other thing that I would add to that, too, is I think Nebraska football often gets caught up in trying to be more than just a football program. Right. We, we felt that, I think, last year with the pandemic where right. Scott Frost and, and the administration felt, you know, a responsibility, say, to the, the local economy to get things going. Or they feel um, uh, maybe a certain responsibility to the way things should be done morally or ethically. And right. You know, I'm, I'm always a challenge. Remarkable. It's hard to take those things on. And, and you talk about like the bubble that we live in, Sam. And, and I, I think sometimes it's easy to kind of forget that. And then, you know, you go to Big Ten Media Days or you go and you see some of these other programs and, and they're just they're doing football like that's, you know, it, right. Life in the state is not based around those other programs. And in a lot of ways, that makes Nebraska's fan base special and, and different and pretty powerful. But in some ways, too. It does. It can be draining because you're trying to be so much more than just a football program. And I think sometimes people within that program feel that burden, too. Mm -hmm. Agreed. What did you think of some others yesterday, Evan? You watched him for a little while. He's the backup quarterback. Adrian's obviously going to be a starter. Um, they're going to say all kinds of stuff about Adrian. Critics are going to say whatever they say, but ultimately Adrian will or won't based on his performance. But what about the backup? What did you think of Logan yesterday? Well, I thought what was most notable was that, you know, his throwing motion was a lot smoother than it was in the spring. And we saw him a lot more in the spring mm -hmm. at, some, at the spring game, of course, and, and some of the uh, open sessions. But, you know, at that time, as he told us, he was overhauling his throwing motion. And so in some ways it was unfair to kind of judge or evaluate where he was at that time, because he was working through a lot of things with Mario Verduzco, the quarterback's coach. And so even just seeing him for 20 minutes, like we did uh, Wednesday, I, I thought it was a smoother motion. I mean, you know, it was, it was a little more than uh, kind of that three-quarter slot above his head. It looked very natural, uh, you know, for the most part, 
the balls were finding their targets. And, you know, you pair that with his reputation as one of the fastest guys on the team. He was a standout sprinter from the state of Alabama. Um, you know, you feel a little bit better about, I, I suppose, what he could do to come in. Now, obviously, Nebraska doesn't want to take Adrian Martinez off the field um, unless the game is well in hand or, or decided one way or the other. Right. Um, and, and as we know, over the years, injuries are always going to crop up with running quarterbacks. They have with Adrian every year. It still seems like Smothers would be that backup. Heinrich Harburg, uh, long term, I think, has a, a sky high ceiling too. just what he can do physically with his arm, with his speed. Much better passer. Uh, yeah, no doubt. He's, he's got a strong arm. But, um, you know, I, I guess I felt better about Smothers. I felt better about where his throwing motion was relative to the spring. But again, you know, it, obviously you don't want to see what he can do in a, in a high leverage situation um, just because that means obviously you're, you're, you're not rolling with your number one for whatever reason. Yeah, concerned about the pace of the ball coming out of his hand. Um, I think that was the thing that I saw. You know, Nebraska wants in, – in a Matt Lubick offense, the, the hope that is that you, you hit a lot of shorter passes, that you're able to throw the stuff in rhythm, throw it with pace – uh, get the ball out of your hand quickly. I think Smothers does that okay. But how quickly does it get to the intended target? And then you 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 build into that four or five deep passes a game where you can maybe hit a deep post or a deep angle. But but you have to start with hitting the throws underneath. And in order to get that stuff where you don't throw interceptions and you're also getting yards after the catch, you got to throw the ball with pace. And and his pace was was okay. I mean, I, I, I think that would be the way that I would put that, um, you know, and 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 in the throwing drills that we were able to see, I'd say Harburg has just got a stronger arm and other things. But uh, I think Smothers has a better grasp of the offense. And again, Nebraska football lives in this on offense. They live in this world where they'd love to do what they want and what they like. But if they can't get protection, a downhill running game and receivers open. They have to lean on the quarterback to run. They just have to. That's part of the deal. And they don't want to. I don't think they want to run the quarterback 12, 15 times a game, but they've had to do it over and over again because they have not been able to develop the other pieces. And I think Smothers is is, is better equipped at this point um, to deal with the wear and tear. Harburg is still very is still pretty thin. I know there was a message board rumor rolling out there at some point that Smothers was 180 pounds and Harburg had gained 30 and there's been a lot of misinter <laughs> there's been a lot of misinformation I think about that position generally speaking over the years but um but that was misinformation I mean Harburg still has lots of weight to gain and will gain it over the next 12 months whereas Smothers actually looks fairly into his body he's the shortest of the three the three top quarterbacks hey Sam okay can I ask a question? Um, Please. I just want to back up two minutes um, because I think we would all agree that, that the attention and the publicity surrounding Nebraska's program uh, in reference to what you guys were talking about has been an inhibitor rather than a boost. Um, you know, it's, it's gotten in the way, the, the, the constant noise around the program, the, sense of you know maybe the 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 sense of of too much hope or too much hype going into seasons and i I guess i'm curious like from jimmy's perspective you know because i I don't look at kansas basketball and say oh man look at all the attention on that program that must be really wearing on the players and must be getting in the way of their success um you know at ohio state and alabama i think it's generally understood that the, you know, the hype that comes with it is, is a boost to the program. Right. Um, I'm curious from, I'm curious from Jimmy's perspective, if, if the way that Nebraska sees it's the attention around the program, if that is indeed like, are we crazy to think that that's getting, in, that that's getting in the way? Is that just an excuse? I, I'm, I'm interested from an outsider's perspective. I don't think, I don't think that it's necessarily the buzz itself. I think it's the disconnect between the buzz and what has been the on-field product because then you're in a weird crossroads situation where everyone in the program is trying to sell and everyone who is a fan of the program wants to believe 
that you can get back to the the buzz and live up to the buzz again. But when that's when that's not happening, that the what could be viewed as a boost is negative pressure and it can it's a lot for 19 to 22 or in this year 24 25 year old kids to to deal with agreed yeah i mean we, we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna slow down our coverage of it people love it they eat it up they're obviously fascinated by it and this is a really fascinating year um i've often said i don't need to cover um a, a title winning team because every story is is good unto itself i mean if uh, give me, just tell me what the story is going to be and let's see what happens. And, and so I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes. I would agree that part of what's happened is players have to keep going out there and talking about how it's going to get better. And I think, again, they're ready and the coaching staff is ready to just see it be better. Um, and, and it, it'll be, it'll be, I think a more enjoyable experience. And if they, I, I look, I, I, I sense the coaches are, the assistants, especially there's an urgency there. They're, they're tired of, they're tired of losing the special team stuff that Evan and I saw yesterday. We have not seen at the open periods that we've been to before. Uh, the intensity was up. Scott Frost is in the middle of the group. You know, he's not leading it, but you know, Mike Dawson is, and he's barking and he's loud. Um, it was, it was different. I mean, it, I think there's a, there's just a, there's a, a fed upness among a lot of these guys where I think they're just ready to do the things they need to do in order to, to win games. I don't know. We've all faced these moments in our lives where, you know, maybe we weren't at our best or we were frustrated or, you know, we, we didn't bring our a game. Um, and then all of a sudden we're like, you know what? I know what I got to do. I got to do this, this, and this, and my life will get a little better as a result. And usually those are things where you don't have somebody trying to stop you from doing it like you do in football. But, but I think that's part of what's going on is they're just, I think they're a little fed up with, with mediocrity. Um, the defense is, was fed up with that last year. I think the offense has gotten to that point too. Uh, I think they know better what they want to do. And we can talk about, I could talk about schematics all day long. Um, certainly. I could do that. Um, I won't because I, there, there's a time for that and, and we're getting closer to it, but I like what they're going to try to do and blending some of Lubick's vision with what Frost does. I think they're getting away from the, um, uh, we think that we're going to get 17 yards on a sweep because all of our offensive linemen stepped to the right while the running back went to the, went to the left place. Um, they're not fooling Northwestern with that. It's just, those plays did work in the AEC. Uh, especially when you got a guys that can run a four, three forty, but a, they don't have guys that can run a four, three forty B it's not fooling people as much in the, in the big 10. And so they're moving away from some of the, all we have to do is line up and trick them plays. I mean, they're just, they're not doing as much of that. And I think they've had to build some, some structure in and, and I, not a ton. I'm not trying to suggest that they've overhauled it, but, but I think you are going to see a little bit, more of, Hey, we're, we need to do some of the plays that a lot of other people do. We just need to do them better. Uh, and I think that's part of what we're seeing. We'll get to Jimmy in a minute with basketball and all of that. I want to talk a little bit about the schedule though. Um, since, uh, obviously Nebraska is playing one hell of a hard schedule, uh, this year, I have to put together an AP poll, an AP ballot, preseason AP ballot. And it's the only ballot that I do each year where it is, it is essentially predictive. Um, I'm, I'm a weird stickler for performance after that. People kind of know how I do things. I'm usually an outlier in my voting uh, to some degree compared to the rest of people. Um, so my, my poll moves around a lot. My ballot's a lot different each week uh, based on what I see in performance. Um, but the first one that I have is predictive because we're not basing it on last year, somewhat on last year, but also somewhat on what we think is going to happen. And I think there's a distinct possibility that when I'm done with this thing, um, I could have six teams that Nebraska plays this year that are in the top 25. Um, and that would be half of the schedule. Obviously, Oklahoma and Ohio State are in that group. Wisconsin and Iowa are in that group. And then I have to, and then I have to chew on Minnesota and Michigan. At this moment, I'm leaning out on Michigan. Um, and I would say that I'm leaning in on Minnesota. I might be the only person that ranks Minnesota, but that's kind of the way I'm leaning at this point. But Evan is, you know, we're going through our special section stuff. We obviously have to do 
the schedule and we, you know, we kind of break down each game. I think you have the first half of a schedule in our special section. So you have all of the non-conference and some of those earlier games. When you look at Nebraska's schedule this year, A, how excited are you to actually cover all these games in all these spots? But B, how daunting does it seem knowing what we know one week into camp? Yeah, I mean, from a from a coverage perspective and, and just like a, an enjoyment of, of football games perspective, it's fantastic. I, I think it's a really interesting, fun schedule. I mean, going to, uh, you know, going to Oklahoma is going to be a ton of fun. I think Illinois week zero. I know a lot of people don't love Champaign, but I actually kind of like that trip among the especially among the West uh, trips that Why? are out there because it's not Purdue because. Right. It's, this is know, true. I don't know. I, I just, I don't mind the trip. It's, it's, uh, it's very Midwesterny and, and the foliage is good. What, whatever. But it is quality foliage on the way to Illinois. No, fo- hey, no, no foliage on August 28th, Evan. Sorry about that. There's foliage. Know, it's it's, it's going to be green. There's corn. Yeah. yeah that, and truly, true. truly, I tell you, um, I don't know why I just said it like that, but <laughs> anyway, Illinois is so rural. Like it's way it's more rural than at Lincoln. Champaign, Illinois is oh, yeah. truly in the middle of a rural. It's rural. You, you have to actually carry the R out. It's I mean, so rural. And p- part of it too is I like going to places that I wouldn't go to like on my own free time. Like yeah. I, I, I as an individual have no reason to ever go to Champaign, Illinois. So to go there to, to see a football game is fun. It's different. It's you know it's it's a different experience, and it's not Purdue. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the first half is interesting. Illinois, to start, is such a an interesting kind of spicy tone setter for the season because you're not kind of dipping your toe in this thing with a couple home non-cons where you get everybody, you know, uh, falsely excited for things and your, your stats are ballooned or whatever. I mean, Illinois, I think, is a perfect sort of, uh, you know, uh, standard to start with where you have a, a team with a new co- coach and Brett Bielema who is very accomplished in the Big Ten. Uh, is bringing a lot back and it's a conference game for Nebraska. So yeah. if you, if you lose that, I mean, obviously your, your mood going forward is going to be tough. That, that puts a cloud on the whole season right away. But if you win that, you got Fordham and Buffalo after that Buffalo starting totally over right now. Um, I mean, there's, there's no reason you can't be three and oh, and looking forward to the Oklahoma game and, and what that could mean as opposed to dreading it and hoping you don't get embarrassed um, you know, and, and then from there, Michigan State is really fascinating, too, with a, 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 a essentially a new coach and Mel Tucker who got things yeah. going this year. Um, you know, that's fascinating, too. So, like, I think when you look at the first half of the schedule, to me, it's about can you build some momentum? Right. Like Scott Frost first year, his first game gets you know rained out. Essentially, they start 0 six. Uh, Ohio State last year was a major bummer. And mm-hmm. so, you know, the Colorado overtime loss in 2019 fall. Yeah. got things started so like it just it just feels like man it, every year they've started behind the eight ball if you can start three and oh if you can start you know four and one and maybe start to to build something then this thing gets interesting because you talk about storylines we've had kind of the same storyline the last two or three years can they can they flip that a little bit and if they can then the second half and some of those teams you're talking about in the top 25 suddenly those become interesting games instead of just kind of you know, kicking somebody when they're down and finishing the string out. It is, it is totally, it's totally amazing how bad Nebraska starts have been. I mean, it's just, (laughs) if you were like drawing out worst case scenarios, almost every year, uh, it would look something like it did. I mean, you know, Ohio state, they looked okay, but, uh, you're absolutely right, Evan. I mean, if they, if they can get off to a semi hot start, um, it will feel totally different around this program. They they just, their inability to, to get anything going or sustain any momentum the last few years is, and even like, you know, even last year um, with the exception of basically November of 2018, they just, they just haven't been able to, to get anything going. And this, the first three games of this year is, is a really legitimate chance to do that. Let me ask you this, Derek. It, will it feel different if they start three and zero and then get throttled by Oklahoma? Well, <laughs> I think no matter what their record is going into the OU game, there's going to be a lot of fear um, that they're going to get humiliated. And in some ways uh, that thing will compare to the Ohio state game last year, where 
Nebraska, Nebraska fans are going to go in and just, just hope they can, you know, save face. But, um, no, it's a good point. I mean, no matter how good you start, you've got that OU game sort of waiting for you. Um, and I, I think it's just – it's really important. You know, Nebraska has been humiliated several times over the last five years, and um, that's an important game for your national reputation, you know, just to, to be competitive. Mm-hmm. This is the best OU team is since 08, Jimmy, um, on paper. Yeah. On the field, it's probably that good too. Um, they're the number one team in the country. I think they're going to be preseason number one because Alabama cannot speak to its quarterback yet. And Clemson can, they know who it's going to be for sure and how good he is. But I think Oklahoma will be your preseason number one. So I don't know how Nebraska fans will feel about that game. They're going to play the best team in the country. See, we're talking about insider, outsider perspective here, outsider perspective, people are watching that Oklahoma game. They're not paying attention to Illinois. Right. They're probably not paying attention to Michigan State the week after that or Northwestern the week after that. They're paying attention to Oklahoma. They're paying attention to Michigan. They're paying attention to Ohio State and Wisconsin. I think that's exactly right. That's yes. where this team's identity will be defined right there. Yep. They, the players very, very much want that Oklahoma game. Um and one of the things that was a mistake in trying to pursue maybe getting out of that game or whatever they were trying to do is, you know, the players want to play that game. They want to play that game. And that is a, that's like a bowl game scenario. Um, there's going to be 5 million people watching it and players know that they're going to put a lot into it. I think you make a good point when you say those are the four games uh, that people will be watching. I think that's pretty fair. I think Minnesota, I will put Minnesota in there because I think Minnesota is going to be pretty good. Um, but I agree. And so much of the focus around here, and again, it's always contextual. When we think of Nebraska football, we think of how is Scott Frost going to keep his job by going six and six or seven and five this year so that we can go on to next year and see if he can do that too. Great, great point. I think when people from outside, including high-level recruits, are watching, they're like, how does Nebraska stack up against Oklahoma, Ohio State, Michigan, and Wisconsin? Exactly. Like, when you think about the games you need to win to shape the perception of your program long-term, those are the games you think about. The problem with Nebraska in the last five years is they can't win the other games, right? Right. So Bo Pelini could always do the other. He, he could always win the walkovers. He was pretty good at that. Um, he could always he could post nine wins. He couldn't beat the big game. He couldn't win the big games, but he could win the small ones. At this moment, Nebraska can't even win the small ones. And so it's almost like they're like, how do I renovate my house but not even make my own bed? Is kind of where it's at at this moment. And so like that's the piece that yes, absolutely, I agree with you. That's that's what yes. Those are the games that matter. Are they going to win them? Bo couldn't. That's why he was fired. <laughs> and, and to your point, though, it, you have to win the small ones before you can even think about winning yeah. the, the big ones. So that, that part is on a on, – from our perspective, what we're paying attention to, that is almost as important because right. we're, we're so many steps behind trying to, to beat Oklahoma, Michigan, Wisconsin here. Let's, you know – that's why we're talking about this Illinois Ford and Buffalo stretch in the first place. I think the hope is that, that by winning the first three, it gives you a better chance. You know, it, it propels you, it brings your team together. It does all those intangible things that make it, you know, more likely that you can thrive, um, you know, when it really matters. So it's not, it, it is, you can separate, you know, the, the big six and the little six games, but, um, I think the, the hope is that, and you see this with teams sometimes that, that sort of come together over the course of a season, um, you know, whether it's Iowa state or Northwestern or, you know, Minnesota, there's been teams over the last five years that you looked at them in September and said, they got no chance to be a great team. And yet it all kind of falls into place. And I think that's the hope with Nebraska that, that, uh, if you can get on a little bit of a roll and get some momentum. Uh, suddenly confidence and chemistry become, you know, real assets. Yeah, Minnesota 2019 is the one that stands out to me there, where they won – who was it they they barely beat in that first month, like 
South Dakota State or something like that. Fresno State and South Dakota State. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they barely hung on. And then by the end, they were they were looking good. But the other point I wanted to make, too, was, you know, we, we talk about kind of success relative to expectations. And so you think like who in the Big Ten has been Nebraska's peer in the last three or four years, maybe Purdue, you know, in terms of a team that's had roughly the same amount of success. And so, you know, if you're a Purdue, a Purdue fan, you know, th- nobody would expect Purdue to go in and, and beat Oklahoma. Nobody would expect Purdue um, or nobody's, I guess, using, uh, you know, the Wisconsin game as a measuring stick for Purdue. And yet Nebraska, which has had similar on field success of late, is kind of graded on this different level because it's Nebraska and because, you know, whatever. Um, so I think that kind of plays into it, too, where it's just, you know, people kind of have this outdated view of Nebraska as a national program. And so you, 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 they're judged more harshly than a team kind of performing at the level that it actually is. Yeah. Evan has both trashed Purdue and acted as a spokesman for Purdue on this podcast. That's pretty good. It is. Once you go there, you'll know trying to what be he's talking about. Once you get on the back of that golf cart. They ride to the stadium. It's an experience like any other, unlike any other. It's like the Masters, only in reverse. True. All right, let's talk some basketball. Um, we had two two media sessions with basically every player on the team, except Hoiberg's kid, I think. Uh, that's about it. Like every scholarship guy. And, um, you know, you've also talked – Jimmy, you've also talked to Fred a little bit. Um, I know you haven't been here long, uh, but I'd love to hear just a little bit of your perspective about what you love about basketball, you know, what, um, you know, why you love the sport, what you've seen of Nebraska so far, what it, what it feels like and what your impression so far of the players and the coaches have been. All right. So I love basketball because my family played it that uh, my mom and dad both played small time college ball. Uh, I've played it my whole life. Um, I love it's. I think it's the most aesthetically pleasing sport at its, at its peak. I think, um, I don't know, a great, a great pass in basketball or a great dribble move. It's something that I can appreciate a little bit better than even like a one handed, a one handed catch is just something where I can't wrap my head around me being able to do the hotel Odell Beckham jr. Catch on the pile. Right. right? Yeah. But if you if you dribble two balls alone in a gym, in a gym long enough, maybe you can do the Steph Curry between the legs behind the back type deal or make a, a no look bounce pass, something like that. Um, what I like about this program specifically is I like the style that Fred plays, which is an NBA style. I like that they play a little quicker than a lot of college teams. They're not as um, hell bent on getting post touches inside. I like that they space the floor. That's, that's a, a, a geometric look that I'm used to seeing in basketball. Most, most college basketball, I think a little cloggy, a little too slow, a little too hands-on from the, from, from the coaches, not a lot, not enough player um, room to, to make decisions. I like that Fred gives the, it gives the autonomy to his players within the flow of his system. My impression of the team and, and from meeting Fred would be that, they're sitting here just like us. They don't really know what to expect. I think they got the, the idea that they went out and grabbed an Alonzo verge in, in the transfer market is, is a kind of a, like an insurance grab. It's a, it's a, if in case one of these many new guys that we have doesn't work out like we want to kind of thing. It, I think that um, it's a, it remains to be seen how the, I think there's six former four-star recruits on this team. Yeah. Those four star guys, they're, you know, six four star guys expect to start. And that doesn't, we're not even talking about Trey McGowan's. Who's right? You're not Bryce. Who's, yeah. who's the returning scorer? No, I'm talking about Trey, who's the returning right. leading scorer. Um, Bryce is included in the, because he's a five star, who's right. at least a four star. Um, how are those guys going to mesh? So one of those guys, odds are six of them, one of them is not going to get the, the role that they want. How is that going to play out? Fred mentioned, um, I'm not, I don't think I'm giving any trade secrets away here at the media lunch. He said they might go deeper than they, than he's used to going at the, at the media lunch we had this week. That to me suggests I'm experimenting. I want to see how these different groups look together. I want I'm going to put different groups of players on the floor and see how they mesh. So 
it, it makes sense that it's early in the season. We would not n- know a lot about the basketball team right now, but it seems more than maybe would be happening at other que- at other programs. There's a whole lot of we're going to see what happens going on here. One of the things that's interesting to me about Fred and, and the way that he's done things at Nebraska is, again, the success hasn't been there yet. They've won 14 games in two years. Uh, they inherited very, very little uh, Tim Miles maxed out in terms of he knew going into his final year, that team was either going to make the NCAA tournament or he wasn't going to keep his job. And so there wasn't a lot behind it. And so when they got here, there wasn't much there and they had to do the best they could to make a program. And that team wasn't very good. And it, 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 they knew it and they, they revamped. And then the second team was hit by COVID at a bad time. And it was a weird schedule and the big 10 was awesome and all the rest, but Fred's never wavered from running the offense. Um, he stuck to the plan. He stuck to his template and they play with pace. They play with a hell of a lot of pace when they probably could have won more games, not doing it. I mean, they could have slowed things down and probably at some point beaten Maryland and Maryland is a team that I think, again, Maryland's a fine basketball program. I think they're three and O against Hoiberg, but gosh, darn it. I think Nebraska could have beat them. But they, they played fast, and, you know, they played at one point, and when they played the back-to-back games, I'm like, you guys need to slow down. I mean, you're, you're playing back-to-back road games. Play Maryland into a loss. You keep playing them into a win. But he has stuck to his guns. He's, he's really stuck to that template. And do you think, just again, first blush, that he has the players that can actually uh, embrace and excel in the template that he wants? Well, it's really interesting that you you bring up the point about him sticking with the fast paced stuff when they could have gone slow because in theory the reason you do that is to build for the futures. You know, maybe we're not going to win this playing this way now with this group of guys, but maybe next year or in two years. Well, the problem with that is they have a whole bat- brand new batch of guys every year he's been here. So it I would assume we'll probably see some similar growing pains at times. Now the guys that they've brought in, they've upgraded the talent each time. I think we can all agree on that. Even though it's been a new group every time, they've upgraded the talent each time. The talent exists to be able to excel that level. It's just a matter of how quick is it going to gel. And when you have, again, another brand new group, I I don't know. It's going to be harder for sure. This is, I I think Jimmy's analysis is spot on. Um, And I think that, you know, what distinguishes this group is that these are bona fide you know, recruits, these are bona fide basketball players who have shown their talent at other places, whether it was in high school on the AAU circuit or at other colleges. I mean, these, these are not the types of newcomers that you would expect from a team that's struggled like Nebraska has the last two years. The, the challenge, I think that creates even a greater challenge with, with chemistry and putting pieces together when you're bringing in four-star recruits and, you know, there's essentially six guys for, for two or three spots. Um, you're going to have some discontent and probably even more than, you know, even if you succeed, you're going to have some discontent. So I think it's really good that Nebraska, it's great that Nebraska has upgraded the talent in a way that I did not foresee coming, to be honest. Um, but it's going to, it's going to pose some challenges because there, there needs to be some real, you know, role defining over the next three or four months. There does it, boy. It sure helps Hoiberg's case that Delano Ban got drafted. That I guess I was surprised. I, I shouldn't have been. Um, you know, there's certainly things about Banton's skill set that project to the NBA or the professional level better than they do to a Nebraska basketball team that you know didn't have the players to take a, take advantage of his full skill set. Uh, but Damn. Man, that's a, feather, so that's a feather in, in Nebraska's cap, even if even if Banton got drafted on his skill set alone. Yeah, Sam, you, you are right to be surprised. I was shocked. I mean, had you told me six months ago or three months ago that he was going to get drafted, I would have been shocked. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a credit to – I'm going to give the player most of the credit here I because I think, yeah. I think he worked his – you know, I think he worked his butt off the last three or four months – uh, clearly he has some size and skill that, that translates better to the NBA than it does to college. But, but let's just be honest. He was not a very good player last season. 
Well, can I can I play devil's advocate? Like why I, I would like to hear an explanation of why that's a feather in Nebraska's cap if the guy who NBA teams see as a good player didn't have a ton of success at Nebraska. I mean, we talk about that in football a lot where, hey, you know, Nebraska's D-line wasn't all that great two years ago, but they had three guys now on NFL rosters. And that was seen as an indictment on the staff. So why, I guess, how, how do you kind of flip that around and say that, that that's a good thing for Nebraska? It's a fair question. Well, he wouldn't have been drafted out of Western Kentucky. I think he probably would have had better stats there, uh, but I wouldn't have anticipated that. I, I think Fred's relationship with almost every NBA franchise uh, is very helpful in that process. Toronto may certainly desire to draft Ben. I mean, he's from there. Uh, this gives them an opportunity to draft a kid from there. It, it can only help Toronto, uh, the grassroots basketball program there, to know that you can go back home and play for the NBA team. And so there's, you know, I, I think Toronto, that is, that's very pleasing to them. And they, you know, they don't lose a lot if they don't, if he doesn't pan out. Um, but Banton spent two years in a system that is very similar to what he's going to go to at the next level. It's, it's, it, you know, it's not unlike uh, pro style football teams producing draft picks, even if the team itself wasn't that good. I mean, it, um, and, it, and the other thing I will say for Banton is that Nebraska as comprised could not take advantage full advantage of the things that he was good at. For example, they didn't have that many good three-point shooters. And so a guy who is 6'9 and can get into the lane and then kick out is not kicking. He's kicking out to 34% versus he's kicking out to 44%. So that guy gets overplayed and Benton can get all the way to the rim. They were collapsing on Banton as the season went on. They weren't letting him get all the way to the rim. And the bottom line is he couldn't make 15-foot jumpers with consistency but maybe he can do those things in the NBA. We have seen players. One of my favorite players is De'Aaron Fox. Now, he, Fox is way better than Ben, way faster. But Fox was a terrible shooter in college. He just got to the rim all the time. And then when he went to the NBA, he became a pretty good shooter. And so Banton can, can improve there. It looks good for Nebraska. It's a feather in their cap because they can go right back out and say, look, we took this guy from Western Kentucky where he made three, where he averaged three points and two assists a game. And he was an NBA draft pick two years later. Come play for us. We will get you to your dreams. It's, here's, here's the other it's thing, an easy Evan. connection. Here's the other thing, Evan. When the Toronto Raptors are making calls on Delano Banton or the next Nebraska borderline draftable player, they're not just calling a college coach. They're calling, in many cases, a guy they know, a guy whose opinion they trust, a guy who has operated on their playing field before. You could, I would argue that Delonto Banton comes to Nebraska, name a coach on a, on, you know, just an average college basketball coach. He does the exact same thing, has the same positional size and skills. He might not get drafted because Masai Ujiri calls college coach X and that guy, he just doesn't have the same kind of relationship with, with those kinds of people that Fred does. Yeah, I think that, I mean, there's definitely something to that. So, you know, Fred, for example, when he goes to the Iverson thing and the Iverson thing turned into the de facto, it basically turned into a five-star high school combine because they didn't have the McDonald's game. And so the Iverson thing was all weak. And for Fred's able to not only receive insight from NBA, from NBA people, but he's also able to give insight. And so what he, what he's able to bring from that and, you know, and, what, what he and I talked about from that Iverson event, I'll just say this. It was all off the record, and it's all turned out to be true. That's, he, he was able to make a prediction about something that was going to happen that happened based solely on what happened. And he couldn't be at that thing. But, but the, the NBA people were there, and he said, this is going to happen. And then it happened. So he's, he's pretty insightful. Mm. Um, he kind of – he holds that stuff close to the chest – He's so different in that way than Tim Miles, who would literally tell you everything. Tim was like a journalist. Um, Fred's different in that way, but but his insight is is valued, and he also he also n listens to the right, knows the right people, and who say say the right things. Put mm -hmm. it that way.
I, I just add one other thing about Nebraska basketball too. And, you know, we talk about the expectations or the burden that can sometimes come with the, the football side of things. Basketball is the total opposite. I mean, the whole uh, reputation about not having won a, an NCAA tournament game plays to their favor oftentimes to, to the current team because yeah. all they got to do is make the tournament win one game and they're going to be remembered forever. Like there's no, there's no heaviness of looking back and saying like, Oh, you know, this team won national championships and here's the standard we have to live up to. Like these guys have every reason in the world to play light, to, to play like they're uh, starting something new, like they're working with a blank canvas. And, and I think sometimes, you know, all that intangible off the field stuff, absolutely can translate into how they play on the field or on the, on the court in this case too. Sam, what does it's it a great, all it's, the, it's, <laughs> ahead, it's a great point. It's a great point, Evan, because just imagine an alternate universe where a Nebraska football player sits up at the opening press conference of the season and says, you know, our dream is to, our dream is to, to make the top 32 in the final poll. You know, we're, we're just, we really want to get into that top 32. And that's, yeah. you know, that's essentially what, what Trey McGowan said. He said, you know, we want to get to the tournament and win a game and uh, be the first team in school history to do that. And I, I agree. I think it, it creates a much more manageable set of expectations. Um, and it also, you know, gives your players uh, something to, you know, a real driving motivation. I mean, I think it, it's a, it's a unifying goal in that sense uh, because every all those guys know what the NCAA tournament is and what it means and uh, the question that that just hangs over all of these teams is you know how do they fit together and can they make jump shots and um, we'll find out I, I think Nebraska still has some roster flaws but it's it's going to be I think easily the best of Fred Hoiberg's three teams we should have an ongoing segment called Dirk Chatland's roster flaws <laughs> I like that uh, point out the flaws in each roster across many sports. Not just Nebraska, Creighton, UNO, the NBA. Well, you're uh, I was a big fan of your your football story today. Uh, that red zone stuff is is fascinating to me. Um, and you know we've done a lot of that with Nebraska football, special teams, turnovers, etc. Yeah. Uh, but I man, I I love stories like that. I think uh, I think you just learn a lot about a team by studying its weaknesses. Um, and often it's, you know, how a team changes its weaknesses, but, you know, I think, uh, I, I think weaknesses are, are almost always exposed and it's uh, we've seen it with, with both Nebraska primary sports over the last few years. Yeah. The red zone is, the red zone has been really poor and, and it's uh, there's, there's a line between, poor and mediocre and mediocre and great. And, you know, Minnesota and Wisconsin have been pretty great over the last couple of years. Nebraska has been poor and it's mostly in the throw game. I mean, they've, they've just got to get better there. And if Adrian Martinez wants to get drafted in the NFL, that's where he's got to get a lot better. You, you have to make hard throws. You have to make them sooner than he often does. You're not, when you're in the red zone, you're rarely going to make the play out of the pocket. It gets much harder to throw when you're outside the pocket in the red zone you have to you have to drop back, put your foot in the ground, and throw the ball, or you have to have a one step drop and throw the touch the touch ball. You know, those are the those are the key things. So we'll see we'll see if they do hey, that. I, Sam, I don't know. Sam, can I ask you an off the wall question? And, and sure. Evan, I would I would ask for your input on this too. If if Adrian Martinez develops, which NFL quarterback do you think he could be similar to or projects, you know, as, as that type of profile, is there a guy, is there a guy out there? I mean, I, I don't think he's Josh Allen. No. Um, so no. I'm just saying best case scenario, he develops, he has a really good senior year. You know, he gets drafted in the third round. Is there an NFL guy that you, that you look at and say, ah, oh, that could be Adrian in five years. Do you have an answer, Evan? Not right offhand, do you? Yeah, and again, people, I, I want people to understand I'm not making a collegiate comparison, but a professional one, Mariota, probably. And Marcus Mariota has not been a great NFL quarterback. I mean, he hasn't. He's been, he won a playoff game in Kansas City, at Kansas City. Um, he's, he's had moments up and down, but that, 
uh, you know, um, he's not – Mariota's about 6'3", also very skinny, has stayed skinny, probably needs to. Um, you know, that would probably be the, the comparison piece that I would use is Mariota. He's not Mahomes. And, and I feel I feel he got those comparisons a couple of years ago, but Pat, Patrick Mahomes, A, is a baseball player. B can throw the ball about 75 yards and Martinez can't do that. Um, no one can. So he's not Mahomes. Um, you know, I yeah, don't I would, know. I would say to you, to the, I think Mariota is an apt Bridgewater play style. maybe. I'd say Mariota is an apt play style comparison. Um, but I think Marcus Mariota was also one of the most accurate college quarterbacks of all time. And so Adrian, while he, what was he, fourth in FBS completion percentage last year, a lot of that uh-huh. was because they're throwing the ball short a whole lot, and he needs to. So was Mariota. Yeah. Right, that's true, that's true. But he had the speed, he, he had the burners. Speed. True, but he, I mean, he, so. he, sh- he showed a lot more proficiency throwing the ball downfield than Martinez has. Uh, yes. my, I would like to ask a follow-up question to that, which is, if Adrian develops is an interesting premise to me because he's been in the same system for for four years with Frost and and the same offensive coaches, shouldn't that have happened by now? Physically, he, he appears to be much closer to who he was as a true freshman. Um, people have, will have varying degrees of opinion on this. I don't think he's had much help since Stanley Morgan left the building. I just don't. And I, um, they have not helped him much. And to the extent that he's had it again, we're talking about five foot nine JD Spielman and five foot listed at 10, but probably five foot eight Wandell Robinson. And, you know, the best under five ten receiver in NFL history is Steve Smith. And he was really good, but there aren't a lot like that. There just aren't. And so you have to um, – and neither Wandale nor J.D. were outside receivers. They were both – neither one of them were Deshaun Jackson is my point. Um, Julian Edelman is highly offended by what you just said. Sam. Yeah, is he – I don't know what Julian Edelman's height is, but Julian's also a slot. I mean, he's a slot receiver. You know, it's – in the NFL, it's very hard to be a 5'10 outside receiver unless you're Steve Smith or Deshaun Jackson and you have elite speed. But, you know, everybody remember when Tavon Austin was great in college, unbelievable. He went to the NFL and he was just okay because it's just very hard to be an elite player at that position unless you're six foot or taller. And if you look at Nebraska's six foot or taller receivers since Stan left, um, kind of I know, um, you know, Levi Falk, Omar Manning has not played. Xavier Betts was a freshman. So this will be the best. This will be the best supporting cast he's ever had, Jimmy. And I think it will have a it will have an effect. Um, I'm not a quarterback coach. The things that I see on film, there are concerning things about his play that are imperfect. Um, but I would love to see what it would look like if he had players around him that were 65 percent of what Mac Jones enjoyed. And Mac Jones is a pretty good quarterback, actually. Uh, he was a much better quarterback than people gave him credit for last year at Alabama. But Mac Jones could throw that little, you know, satellite right off to the side to Devonta Smith, and it was it was like magic. And that's, you know, he threw a one-yard pass. So those kind of things are – you'd love to see Martinez have that kind of – 65 to 70% of that, and he, well, he hasn't had it. And, and, the, and the flip side of that is is the whole Joe Burrow – argument like well what if joe burrow had come to nebraska like yeah it is he wouldn't have won the heisman right so like how oh, God, burrow was burrow's better than joe burrow thing. We're gonna do yeah, but, but, the point, thing. but the point remains like as after the fact and, and i've defended nebraska for for not taking joe burrow i've written this i've defended it i feel really good about it knowing what we know now burrow was a better player Knowing what we knew then, we didn't know that, and nor nor was it no. worth the squeeze. But no, in my uh, opinion, but Burrow, no. yeah, Burrow is certainly a more accurate quarterback. My, my, my only point being that you surround a, a quarterback with lesser talent, they're not going to perform as well. And I think that looking Burrow at it, had, Burrow stuff. had three first round picks as receiver receivers, and he had the best receiving running back in in college football in Edward Solaire. So Burrow had a great benefit. The thing that Joe also did though 
is they were able to empty their sets, literally empty them, and go four and five wides because Hilaire was essentially a wide. Because Joe was so smart and he was so able to handle throwing with basically no protection other than the five guys in front of him. And I don't think that's true of Adrian. I, I don't think he I don't think he is a you know run and shoot um, you know uh, kind of quarterback. You know Burrow is like Andre Ware. I think he's going to be better than Andre Ware in, in in the NFL. But but Andre Ware was a guy that could just basically sit there with five wides. Warren Moon. That's who Burrow is. And I don't think Martinez is that good. Hey, I think we're wrapping it up. I got to ask Jimmy one more question. Uh, I, I like to ask questions more than answer questions. Jimmy, do you have, as an Ohio U graduate, do you have a Frank Solich story worth telling? Oh, man. Um, I mean, other the, the, best, the best one worth telling is the one that everyone knows where he, he went the wrong way on the, on the court street. He drove the wrong <laughs> direction on Court Street. That was that's a, a Frank low light. But uh, I'm trying to think. He yeah, he's pretty behind the scenes, pretty closed off. So I, I hate to end on a disappointing note, but that's that's all I got. He drove the wrong way on a one way street. Well, that's a that's a that's a, tre- that's a tremendous story on that end of it. Certainly, um, certainly. His, uh, how many how many short side options uh, on third and eight did you witness? How many quarterback draws on third and twelve? Um, these so are the many. things that I, these so are the many. things that I remember. Absolutely, yes. and and punting punting from the opponent's thirty seven. That's all all but of that. Frank's reputation in that athletic department. I know that the basketball team had very interesting seasons. Obviously, John Gross was there at one time, and obviously they just went to the uh, the round of thirty two. But Frank's reputation on that campus was pretty real, pretty good, right? Like, oh, I mean, he he, was he saved he and, saved he saved Ohio football from. Being like it was nothing. It was literally nothing before he got there, and now people at least know that there's a football stadium there. So that is maybe not a huge jump to to people who are listening and have experienced much higher levels of success. But I would argue that that's one of the harder jumps to make. Like that was a Ohio football was a draw on the campus, was it not? Like people well or to the games and stuff. We did we our our college uh, our our podcast our sports podcast in college was called leaving at halftime because <laughs> literally that's that was the move everyone shows up and it seemed like the a lot of the show was the band sometimes the band is very popular down in athens um football program didn't move the needle even they went to the mac title game once while i was there it was i would say that i was surprised that it was on at the bars that's that's where i'll <laughs> say is the interest level in ohio football fair enough basketball now, is just it's just so much easier to for for the kids at a small college to relate to basketball because they can, they can get to the, the national stage. Ohio football will never get there. That's fair. If they'd had Joe Burrow, it would have been interesting. If it Joe had been the quarterback. And his dad, his dad been. has certainly hinted at, at that being a possibility if Ohio State didn't come into the fold. Yeah, because Nebraska didn't want him. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Um, Nebraska did not want him out of high school. They, they, they chose Kevin Dillman instead. That's a story for a different day. For Jimmy, Evan, Dirk, I'm Sam McEwen. This is the Pick 6 Podcast. We'll be back next week to talk about more Husker football camp. Thanks a lot.